I obviously have a favorite color. Um, so yeah, I want to talk about data compression. Um, I think it's something that we all kind of know about to a certain extent, but uh, it's something that I feel like we didn't really touch on in this class, and I think it's kind of cool. So uh, I just want to give sort of a high-level overview of what it is, why it's important, um, a couple general algorithms for basic file compression, and then some more specific ones based on certain file types. I'm going to hopefully have time to talk about images and audio. So what is, what is it, man? Um, like I said, I think we, we all kind of have an idea of what it is. Um, but basically, it's the art of reducing the amount of bits you need to store and transmit data. Um, and the reason I say art is because there's really no optimal approach. It always kind of depends on the type of data that you're trying to compress. So there are a few universal strategies that will compress your data fairly well, but the best strategies are always going to be the ones that can make inferences about the types of data that they're taking in. Um, and its efficiency is generally measured in uh, by something called the compression ratio, which is just the ratio of the uncompressed file size to the compressed file size. So if you can reduce file size by half, it has a compression ratio of two. And there are two real main types of compression, lossless and lossy, which I'm sure you've seen with like audio and anyone who does like image stuff, same thing. Um, so I'll talk about that a little bit later. <laughs> so why is it important? Um, is in storage really cheap? Well, yeah, but uh, I think it's important to always keep uh, scale in mind, and even though storage is becoming cheaper, um, as your site scales, uh, you know the cost of storage grows, and so any amount of compression that you can reduce that you can do do to reduce the amount of storage um, is going to become more important as you scale. Um, it also means uh, quicker data retrieval, so you have a more responsive site, which in turn means a better user experience, um, and it's going to give you access to more users who have slower connections. Maybe they're accessing your site over a cellular network, or maybe they just don't have that great internet where they are. And so um, it's going to allow your servers, your, it's also going to allow your servers to handle higher traffic. And you can see how there would be a compounding effect each time you need to get the data, you know, when you're, the user requests the data, and then you need to retrieve it from the server. And every new request, um, if the file is compressed, each one of those requests it can happen more quickly. Um, in addition to that, um, there's also some cool side effects, like it can actually be an uh, extra security measure. Like you can imagine if you compress an encrypted file, it's almost like encrypting it again, sort of, because most compression algorithms work to sort of create a hash map um, similar to how a lot of encryption works. So, yeah. So here's just a quick chart showing how much time you can save with compression. Um, this is the number that's really important here. Uh, the Google search page loads 66% faster when the data on it is compressed. And so, yeah, you can really think of compression in terms of whether it's lossy or lossless. And what that means is basically uh, lossy compression reduces the bits by identifying unnecessary information and getting rid of it. So that means when you decompress the file, it's going to be smaller than the original file. <laughs> lossless is different by um, because it eliminates those redundant parts, but it still keeps a reference to them and is able to reconstruct them when it decompresses it. So the decompressed file is completely identical to the original file. Uh, lossy compression is generally good for things like images, audio, video, things that uh, the end decompressed product is going to be viewed by people who can't, who won't notice these subtle things that are missing, that these bits of redundant information. But you can imagine why text files need to be compressed losslessly all the time because if you're compressing like a JavaScript file, you know, every character is important. So uh, some examples of lossy compression are JPEG, MP3, uh, AUG, and the reason those question marks are here is because lossless video is pretty rare. Um, the file would just be too huge. So it's always a good idea to compress video and people really won't notice most of the time. So I want to talk about a couple of compression algorithms. Um, these are the three that I want to talk about. <laughs> that is a useful slide. <laughs> um, so this first one is kind of like, probably, it's probably the type that you have, may have seen before, like in Code Wars problems or in Coder Byte, um, where it basically uh, creates, it looks for repeated strings or substrings of a file and maps them to a dictionary or a hash map. And uh, um, obviously LZW compression is much smarter than purely that, 
Um, so like here, here's like a really simple example. You know, it's just replacing these strings with dollar signs and these strings with ampersands. And you can see in this case, it reduces the length uh, almost by half, which is pretty good. Um, so LZW compression is a little bit smarter than that in that uh, it's dynamic in the way that it creates the dictionary. And as it traverses through the string, you can think of it sort of as looking through the string with this window whose size kind of dynamically adjusts. And if it finds a substring and then later it finds out that, that substring is part of another substring, it re it you know re-enters it in the dictionary as that. So uh, it's pretty smart about the way that it does it. And you could see how it's really useful for things like CSS files or HTML files where you'll have a lot of repeated elements like divs. Uh, and so here's an example with a CSS file where all these different references to the same thing just get mapped like that. So the problem with this algorithm is that it doesn't work great for human language where it's harder to predict there aren't as many repeating elements. And what will happen here is that the dictionary is going to grow really large because there's just not that much to condense. And so you need other strategies for things like this. Um, that's when I learned about a really cool thing called Huffman coding. And the way the Huffman coding works is that it relies on assigning the shortest possible symbol to represent the string that occurs most frequently. Um, it's generally used in PDF compression. And so the way it works is you give it a sequence of elements and it organizes those elements into a tree based on the probability of the occurrence. And because of this, uh, the dictionary that it keeps stays as small as possible because the elements that occur most often get represented. If you have whatever element occurs the most is going to be represented probably with like one character. And then whatever element occurs the least, it's OK to represent that with like a little bit of a longer character because it's not going to happen as much. And so what it does is it, it, it organizes these into a tree based on that probability. And then once you make the tree, you can assign each element something called a Huffman code, which is just a sequence of zeros and ones based on how to get to it in that tree. Um, I don't really like, I can't say I fully understand this, but that's like the basic gist of it. Um, it's fast, it's lossless, but it is difficult to implement. And because you have to construct a tree, it does have high space complexity. Um, and then there are lots of algorithms that sort of use this and the other, the one that I just talked about, in conjunction in different ways and sort of try to figure out when it's optimal to use this type and when it's optimal to use that type and switch back and forth. So there's a third type that really kind of blew my mind and I, I can't say that I know how it works, but it's a, it takes the whole string and encodes it into a single number between 0 and 1. Um, and I was reading about this last night and uh, Google's WebP, which is its like latest uh, image compression format that it's been rolling out, uh, uses this. And it's been able to help them decrease image sizes by like 66%. And they, use, they now use WebP for thumbnails, all the thumbnails in YouTube, um, pretty much everything in Google+. So they're like slowly rolling it out into all of their applications because it's really advanced. It has like several different uh, algorithms that it sort of selects between based on the type of input. And it's actually more efficient than that, uh, than that last example. Um, but yeah, I really, I, I don't understand it. But it's pretty cool. <laughs> um, and then, of course, there's middle out, which is too complicated for me to go into right now, but you can research it on your own. Um, image compression. So images account for a lot of what is, a lot of the content on web pages in terms of bytes. And so that's why image compression is such a high priority. Um, and so uh, traditionally, the way that images are compressed, uh, basically you separate the image into blocks, and those blocks can be pixels, but they don't have to. And then you search for similar blocks around, and you replace all the similar blocks with references to the same block. And that's how you get, ironically, this image itself, like this example, is a JPEG. And I had to enlarge it, and so it's already kind of crappy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so ignore that. But you can see that this one looks a lot worse than that one, because they're just you know, copying the same cells over and over again. And then there's Google's WebP format, which, again, uses uh, arithmetic entropy encoding. Um, it separates images into visibly similar areas and then, based, and then chooses an algorithm for each area based on what it thinks is the best way to do it. Um, so it's, it's allowed for 10% faster page loads. And I thought this was really cool. When YouTube switched to WebP for its thumbnails, 
the, the total load time saved across YouTube's however many billion users was 140,000 hours per day. Although, that's, I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> that's probably cool, but. Uh, so this was, this was from their website, and it's sort of just a quick example of like one of the many algorithms that WebP uses. And so rather than looking at blocks and comparing them to their neighbors, it kind of looks at this quadrant of blocks and then does all sorts of operations on it. It looks at the individual rows and compares those to rows around this block. Uh, it rotates it, compares it like that, and does all these operations and compares it to his neighbors until it finds the best match for a, uh, something to replace it with. So I don't have time to talk about lossy compression, um, about audio, which is kind of my favorite part, uh, but that's OK. Um, one thing I'll say is uh, NPR is a really cool quiz that you can take um, where they compress audio at different bit rates, and you can see if you can hear the difference. And so that's really the only practical thing that you'll probably need to know about audio compression unless you're trying to actually compress audio. Here's a quick cheat sheet about which types of files to use for different types of content. And here are some resources that you can check out. Um, there is, oh, this is my conclusion. That's not the right slide. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, I think I pretty much went over all this stuff. I think the next big innovation is just going to come from more improvement in the way that we can predict the type of content that we're trying to compress and make inferences on it and choose the best strategy based on the input. Um, so here are some resources. Um, there's a compression node module that uh, works with Express, and it can compress your server responses in your back end. Um, and there's also a library that lets you store large amounts of data in local storage by compressing them uh, that you can check out here. And a couple more cool things. Uh, Kika is a really good file compressor for Mac. And yeah, any questions? Should be, yeah. How do you decompress a Flack file? Can you do this? Well, Flack is, oh, are you saying like Flack is actually never, it's just not compressed at all? I, I might have, so I think, I think uh, it gets, so it gets compressed, it's still compressed, but it, uh, it retains all of the original information. So when you decompress it, it's the same so size, but it's not, it's so when it's, when it's playing, yeah, it's getting decompressed then. Um, but you don't hear any artifacts that you might uh, hear from a compressed file. Yeah? Uh, I remember seeing something about how some of these are owned by companies. And wouldn't that mean you have to pay them to use some of these compression values? I'm not aware of that, like proprietary compression. Yeah, flag is not proprietary. That's why it's hmm. popular on Right. Well, Fla I think FLAC is also popular on torrents because it's lossless. And a lot of the types of people who torrent music want lossless music, I guess. But um, like AAC is like Apple's codec. And that's supposedly, um, I, believe it's, I believe it's lossy, but it's like pretty good. Um, it's similar in quality to MP3. But I'm, I'm not sure about like proprietary coding formats. Yeah, I did. I, I was able to tell the difference between like a uh, 128-bit MP3 and a uh, 320-bit, but the difference between like a WAV file and a 320-bit, like WAV totally uncompressed, like raw audio, and a file compressed to like either 256 or 320, I was not able to tell the difference. So like I generally keep my music at like 256 or 320. Oh, and I didn't talk about variable bitrate encoding, but that's also a cool thing that I can talk about more later. Yeah? Um, so if you kind of attach, so you mentioned that if you attach a file that you've already compressed, you kind of attach it twice. Um, yeah. So does that mean, like, on, like for, on the other side, if you're trying to like, retrieve it, you have, to, uh, un, you have to, like, keep the dictionary so that you can un? Yeah, you have to have access to both dictionaries, like the both levels of maps. I would say for most people that bit rate is around 256. Although, although if it's a really nice sound system, you yeah. might be able to tell. But it, it varies from person to person. So what can you tell if it's like 256 versus like 192 or like 168? Um, 
Yeah, I would, I would say, at least for me, that's like a discernible difference. Like around 192 and 160 is where it starts to lose quality. But um, I know that like most DJs probably use uh, like 320 MP3s because it's just too expensive to have the WAV files. And also it's just much more accessible. All right, thanks guys. <laughs>